Hey, how are you, Dr. Viana? How's everything? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I was, uh, was it difficult getting on IG Live? It looks like you were pretty smooth. No, it was easy. I haven't done it before, but it was kind of easy. Just had to join it. So that's great. All right. Awesome. Awesome. You know, thanks for joining us. I'm just going to do a brief introduction, uh, you know, while everyone's logging on, uh, yeah. just so they have a background about who you are and the amazing uh, stuff you've accomplished. Uh, Dr. Rodrigo Viana uh, is an internationally recognized pioneer and global leader in transplant surgery. Very lucky to have him with us today. Uh, he's director of the Miami Transplant Institute, uh, chief of liver, intestinal, and multivisceral transplant, and professor of surgery uh, here at UM. Uh, he completed his surgical training and his PhD in Brazil uh, before doing two transplant fellowships here at UM. He's authored nearly 200 peer-reviewed scientific articles and was inducted into Brazil's National Academy of Medicine, which is one of the oldest and most exclusive medical academies in the world. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on the uh, Miami Transplant Institute, uh, which is a unique affiliation between Jackson and UM. Uh, over its 51-year history, uh, the MTI is the largest and most comprehensive transplant program in the United States, which is amazing. Uh, it's the only center in Florida that provides every kind of solid organ transplant uh, and is consistently breaking down new barriers in areas like multi-organ transplant and paired donations. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have you today, Dr. Uh, Viana, to talk about the future of organ transplantation, which I find fascinating. So again, welcome. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for doing this. I'm, I'm glad to be here talking about something that I really love, which is transplantation. Right. Wonderful. It, it's a, you know, and, and the more research I was doing on the topic, uh, the more interested I became. So I'm going to start with just some basics for, for our audience. Um, just tell us what organs can we currently transplant in humans? Yeah, so transplant, I mean, when you talk about solid organ transplant, basically, you know, starting from the bottom down, you can transplant the heart, you can transplant the lungs, you can transplant the liver, you can transplant the pancreas, the intestine, the kidneys. Sometimes we do a combined multi-organ transplants, which, you know, MTI is, is the largest uh, place in, in the country. Uh, we have done up to seven, eight heart organs in the same person. So wow. every from, you know, combined heart and liver. Uh, we also pioneers doing that in the adults in the U.S. Uh, simultaneously, we transplant them on block. So basically, everything in your chest and your abdominal cavity can be transplanted. Uh, the one that still we have done partial transplant, uh, the innervation happens, is the bladder. Uh, but everything else in terms of solid organ transplantation can be replaced. And what is the most commonly transplanted organ? Yeah, the most common transplant is kidney. I mean, there is, a, I mean, there is an epidemic of kidney disease as we become older, and all those diseases that we all know, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, uh, the numbers are just skyrocketing. So, and also we have two kidneys for donation. Every time there is a donation, you donate two kidneys. So, yes, these are the numbers of patients that are listed, uh, 100 plus thousand in the U.S., uh, and that's where the big need is. So that's the most common uh, transplant. Now, what is the most feasible yet technically difficult transplant you guys do? Yeah, so I think the feasible that we, uh, we became really known, uh, not only for everything, is a multivisceral transplant, which is, you know, sometimes we transplant uh, stomach, pancreas, liver, intestine, colon, all those, those are technically extremely difficult, uh, but feasible. Uh, with the good survival rates, uh, we used to have, you know, I did my fellowship 20 years ago. These things had 30, 40% survival. And now if you look at our pediatric program, which is common in kids, sometimes you lose all these organs, you're born without them. Uh, we have clocked anything between 90 and 100% survival for those uh, transplants, which you know, it's incredible when you think about the technology behind the care of those patients with all the organs transplanted. So I think this is feasible, technically extremely difficult, but, you know, it's a life changing, like all of, all of them, mm -hmm. uh, but really a life changing event when you have multi organ failure. Now, I've heard that a double lung is particularly difficult on the patient. Is that, is that true in terms of physical strain, a double lung transplant? Well, it's a, it's a little bit more of a bigger operation, but in reality, it gives, gives you more lung function. You know, instead of having one lung that works, you have two. 
uh, some people will, will, a lot of centers will do one lung and then see how patients go for a long time with the one lung. And then if the patient needs a redo or retransplant, then you still have the other side. So yes, I think yes is a little bit of a bigger operation, but it has both sides. And at the same time, you have two lungs instead of one. Got you. Now, obviously, there's a huge demand for organs, like you were saying, as the population gets older, as our diagnostics get better, huge demand and obviously a very limited supply. How does the transplant list work in terms of priority? How do you get up on the transplant list? How do you move up? How do you get off the transplant list? Yeah, great question. So sometimes it depends on the organ. You know, organs have different priorities. But in general, it's uh, based on how sick you are. So if you look at hearts, lungs, liver, we have scores of points. And then the sicker you are, the higher you go on the list. And the way the organ distribution functions is uh, most recently, most of the organs are going into kind of circles around where the donor organ is. So they go, depending on the organ, 150 miles, 250 miles. So they try to find the sickest patient around you. And then they spread that through big circles, big circles, until you find a, a patient that's suitable for that organ. Uh, kidney has a little bit of, it's going to that kind of uh, distribution too, but it, it accounts for how, how long you've been on the waiting list. You know, there's some areas, uh, we're the largest kidney transplant program in the United States also. And we broke the records of kidneys uh, transplanted. So we have patients that come, you know, like you, you might be in the East Coast, the West Coast, and be waiting eight, 10 years for a transplant. And you come down here because we fly everywhere. It might be a year only or less. So yeah. it, it, it varies dramatically depending, you know, the center that you are and the area that you are. Now, now, along those lines, you guys have the largest transplant program in the U.S., which is truly amazing. How large is your catchment area? Do you guys fly all over the country, international, or are you limited to southeast? So we, we, we have to be limited to the United States in terms of the organs that we transplant. And I think what makes us the largest transplant program in the country is that we have a fully dedicated institute. Everybody that works with us breathes and you know, works and, and gives their blood to do transplants. So we go look at every offer possible that we think it could be a match for our patients. So we get organs from you know, as far as California, Philadelphia, the East Coast, so we, we go everywhere. We, we consider every offer. You know, a lot of the times, um, you know, donors don't look great on paper. As you know, sometimes young people, you get the history of like, oh, God, I'll be okay. And the reality is that when you go there, the organs are great. And, you know, you end up getting organs that sometimes are refused for other centers, but they're great organs. And that's why we became the largest program in the U.S. So your volume is so large. Discuss the on-call procurement team you know, they're obviously working 24 seven. What is it like when a call comes in that a heart, a lung, a pancreas, a kidney is ready and how quickly they have to fly there, procure it and then bring it back? Yeah, I always tell people that if you're gonna be on transplantation, you have to love it. Otherwise, it's a very inconvenient uh, specialty, not only for the hospital, for the physician, for the nurses, for everybody. Uh, basically, you know, we get a call, uh, usually, usually we have some time to make those decisions, you know, four, eight hours, we know ahead of time. Uh, and then we have to see who's on call. We have teams that change calls, who's flying out. Sometimes we ask for the uh, donor hospital, if they have a surgeon available that can do that procurement and then put the organ in a box, in a, in a plane and send it to us. So we do a lot of those uh, because physically it's just impossible. If you look at 730, 740 transfers, it's two a day. So, you know, we're constantly in the OR, there's a team that flies out, we get organs coming in. So it's challenging. We have, a, uh, we have established a donor desk, which is a team of professionals that are constantly just answering the phone, getting planes, you know, arranging for OR times, flight times. So it's kind of a, you know, it's crazy if you go there. You have like a, a TV with all the organs that are where they are, where are they gonna come here? So it's kind of crazy, but it's, it's a very organized, uh, crazy event. And uh, we're lucky to be in an institution, both UIM and Jackson, that really understand what we're trying to do. And that's really important uh, because if you don't have the backup of an institution, it becomes really hard to do this. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it's incredibly time sensitive. You were talking about having a 48 hour window. Overall, how time sensitive is the process so that the organ remains viable? 
Yeah, so we have, depending on the organ, like with the heart, uh, we try to put place those hearts, they have to be in the recipient's body within six hours. So if you think about the, you have to fly out, the, the, the recipient team is already opening the chest, getting everything ready. So when they come back with the heart, the heart goes in. Uh, some of the other organs, we have different technologies coming in, but in general, you can wait up until 12 hours, you know, and uh, the sooner the better, obviously. That organ is on ice, uh, and the sooner you put it in, it's better. But you, we have different technologies that, you know, we'll probably talk about later uh, that we can, you know, try to preserve the organs longer time. But as, as of today, if it goes on ice or with the preservation solution, about 12 organs, 12 hours, the kidneys, we have pumps that we put them on. And we have transplant kidneys sometimes with two days after, and they function perfectly in that pump because they get perfused. So the cells get the nutrition, and we have time to bring those kidneys from all over the country. I mean, truly amazing. Uh, moving towards the future of transplantation, what are some exciting breakthroughs you see happening in the next five or 10 years in the field of organ transplant? So I think several areas are different. I mean, we get... Uh, for example, I mean, this, uh, we just talked about preservation, right? So I think that's going to be incredible. We have, NTI has been part of studies where we preserve the organ, what we call normothermic perfusion. Basically, you take the organ from the donor, you keep that perfused with blood at normal thermic situation, the same temperature as the donor. So in theory, you could keep that organ for a long time there because it's seeing the same conditions as the human body. What does that bring to you? it brings to you the opportunity to see how that organ is going to function before you transplant or to even treat organs before you transplant. So I think the way we're going um, in, in a few years or, you know, maybe in a decade, we're going to have recovery centers where, you know, we take those organs that may be damaged, maybe not transplantable, but on, in these machines with people that are able to recover those organs, we might be able to make them work again giving them time, recovery, what happened to them, and then transplant them. So that's one area. Perfusion is great. Uh, the other one is to, you know, use organs from animals, basically pigs, you know, do uh, genetic modifications. Uh, and I think that will be the final, you know, game on transplantation because there will be no more waiting list. And we're also going towards a, a time that will probably be able to print organs and, you know, like get customized organs in the future. We'll take your DNA, your cells, and then we'll... Plenty of medications coming out. But the really changes that can have an impact in the world, it's really produce and stop the waiting list. And can you imagine how many indications transplant is going to have? Because now we limit the indications because we don't have organs. Uh, there's going to be a time that, you know, this is not working, replace it. Like to take your car to the dealership and say, you know, I need a new engine. So to me, it's one of the most exciting times for transplantation because it's just going to be a complete revolution. Oh, it's incredible. Just, just reading about it, I was just fascinated. You know, um, talking about like organ rejection currently is a major concern. What are the current rates of rejection? and discuss maybe a little bit about immunosuppression and the current medical regimens, how people kind of avoid organ rejection. Yeah, so we, uh, you know, rejection, you can, you can even break that in two things. You can break that in acute rejection, which is, you know, when you place an organ and then you start seeing uh, rejections and, you know, those are, they happen in the first month or the first few months. We became very good reversing that. Like, you know, 99% of the times we can give medication and stop that rejection. Uh, you know, you can either deal with the T cells, you know, the white cells that are rejecting the organ. We have a lot of new medications that can do that. So we got very good at that. And that's across the board. What we're still struggling, and I think that's the next barrier of transplantation, is that what happens over time? You know, we all know that after 10 or 15 years, depending on the organ, even less, you start having a chronic process that, you know, starts slowly causing damage to the organ. So I think all, a lot of the research now is going on, you know, what, what good have you need a match so you don't have that long-term damage. So a lot of, a lot of uh, research is going to, okay, you get this transplant and you know what, don't worry about it. You're going to have this for the rest of your life and it's going to be 10, 20, 30 years and we will be able to stop the chronic process. So I think that's the area that we need to focus now because we became very good 
uh, stopping rejection acutely. Now, one of the things I was reading about in terms of improving transport was the use of drones, potentially. Is this something you guys have looked into or discussed? Is it even remotely on the radar? Yeah, we've, uh, I think we've all seen it. You know, there's even videos of they've, been, they've done trials in, in Europe. I think they've done short flights here in the U.S. Uh, I do believe as, as drones become, you know, very trustable in a way of flying and, and being to the, I mean, you're carrying a human organ. So uh, eventually, I think we're going to have automation and a lot of those things. Uh, and I see in big cities with a lot of traffic, you know, like you go to New York or Sao Paulo or, you know, Tokyo or places where you say, okay, I can save a couple of hours by flying this. I think there's going to be a time that we're going to use the drones, and I don't think that's far away. Wow, exciting to hear. Um, I'm going to go back to what you said before, how there's such a large demand for organs, and that's only increasing, whereas the supply is relatively the same. Talking about ways to kind of increase that supply, and you talked about uh, xenotransplantation, getting organs from animals. Just talk a little bit about how you genetically engineer, let's say, a pig kidney to match a human, just for the lay person. How does that work? Sure. So we have actually, you know, last year, you know, a great colleague of mine, we worked together for 10 years in Indianapolis before I joined UM again. And Joe Tector is a, is a transplant surgeon and is probably the person that understands this the better. Uh, and he joined us uh, last year. He has a huge lab at, at UM in Jackson. And, you know, that pig has been genetically modified. So basically, you look at the genome of the person, you look at the genome of the pig. There are some things that we lost through evolution that the pig has kept. So what happens is that when we see that, we reject, right? Because we see something that we don't have it anymore in our DNA. So what we do is that, okay, we compare those things. We look at the ones that are related to the immune system and can cause a reaction. And now, what ha what the difference between now and 10 years ago is that you have technology, you know, like the CRISPR-Cas9. Basically, you have little scissors, if you want to, for the layperson. There is a little scissor that can go there to the DNA and say, okay, I don't want this piece. Which piece you don't want? I don't want A, B, or C. So you can order that, and it, it became so cheap to do those things. It can go to the DNA and knock that piece off of the DNA, and then the DNA glues itself after that piece has been knocked out. So I think the real deal here is to really eliminate some of the things that we will reject. And one that is a little more tricky is to add a few pieces that we need. Uh, adding is a little more challenging because adding things may, you need to know what that causes in the long term. So, but I think we're very, we're much closer than people think. I think we're a few years, uh, perhaps a couple years, our lab, if everything goes okay, to try to do the first uh, peak kidney to human, which, which is gonna be again, I think it's a life-changing event. It's a medical-changing event because it changes the whole paradigm of using organs from animals. Wow, so you guys might be the first to do it? That's what we want. I don't know if that would be amazing. I mean, so that hasn't been done anywhere in the U.S. or the world? Not successfully. People have tried this before. You know, xenotransplantation was done early, and then everybody, oh, my God, this doesn't work. And then for the longest period, we didn't have a technology to modify the genes, but now we do. So now is a matter of time, you know, to adjust the DNA. And, you know, for example, we have a lot of the, the patients that we have tested their blood and their blood do not react to this kidney. We call them a negative cross match. Before this technology, if you put the blood together, they would just kill each other because, you know, there's cells that attack the other. So I think we're much closer than, than I think the world thinks. Uh, and this definitely in our lifetime, I think in our professional lifetime, we're gonna see it happen. I mean, it sounds like a Nobel Prize potentially based on the fact that the first heart transplant won a Nobel Prize. I would assume that xenotransplantation, the first in the world uh, has Nobel Prize written all over it. So obviously good luck looking into that. Um, what animals besides pigs can we possibly do xenotransplantation with? Yeah, we have. I think the most common organs, uh, animals that people looked into it as, as monkeys and pigs. Uh, monkeys were for anatomically closer to humans, uh, but more challenging to work with. You know, the, the post-op when you do a transplant, the monkeys become very agitated. It's hard to keep them close. 
there is a lot of difficulties, you know, again, you know, you have to deal with a lot of protection for animal societies and all that. So the research is challenging also. There's so many rules uh, to do research in monkeys. So there's less and less facilities that want to do that. Uh, the pigs are also, if you look at the liver, I mean, yes, it's different, but if you look at kidneys, bowels, I mean, they are very similar uh, to human organs. Uh, and it's easier to work with the pig. I think we can do things much faster. Uh, so I think the candidate right now is to do modifications in pigs. Are you guys getting a lot of resistance from PETA, even though it's benefiting humans in the long term? Is that something that I know that most animal research has to deal with some resistance from PETA? Yeah, I think, no, I think it's, a, I think the reality is that this has such an impact all over healthcare that, you know, for as long as you keep things very transparent and you talk to people before, you know, there was the concern of viruses, there is a concern of, you know, transmission of disease. That has been the main concern. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, this is not as, you know, you talk about the swine flu, all those, all those things. Those animals will grow in a facility that protects uh, that from happen. And we will be able to have uh, labs, uh, detection of potential virus before we do those things. So I think we're coming around because technology is going so fast right now. You have PCR mm -hmm. thing, you can detect, you can knock the, the, the virus out. Uh, so I think as far as you keep it clear, uh, regarding virus, I think even religion is a problem sometimes if you don't keep it very clear uh, because some people might understand that you're changing something too big, you know, like you're, you're trying to change nature. And we already use a lot of things from pigs and animals, you know, heart valves and pieces here, pieces there, dura mater and neurosurgery. I mean, we use a lot of things already, uh, cartilages and all that. So I think it's important with all the facets that this will bring just to keep an open conversation. I think that's what's going to advance this. Yeah, I mean, it's such, a, it's such an amazing breakthrough, potentially, that it's not surprising that there's going to be some resistance. And that's just, that's just par for the course. Yes. Talking about technology, uh, another very interesting potential breakthrough that I was reading about was the cloning, was the 3D printing. Uh, that, to me, seems mind-boggling. Explain how you 3D print a kidney, a heart, a lung. How does that work? Yeah. So basically what you do is that you, you, you get an organ that, you know, the cells in the organ are sick anymore and are not working. And basically you use a process to dissolve those cells. So once you dissolve the cells, you have the main structure. You know, those are like small spikes. You have the, the skeleton of the organ. So what you do is that you have stem cells and you, you put growth factors that will change the cell into the cell that you would like to see. And that's how you repopulate that organ now with different stem cells that will give you what you expect. Now, you can see beautiful organs now that we can already do that. We can, you know, print a liver. We can, you know, have the printer fulfill all those spaces. I think one of the challenges that we still see is that it's hard to keep those cells together. So what happens is that the organ is there, but once you start putting blood and all the thing and the function, it kind of falls apart. So we are still to develop a, a technique or what is it that keeps this organ functioning and it keeps it together. The other thing are the vessels, right? You can do all those small vessels, a network of vessels, but then to plug the organ in, you need the big ones. And we're gonna have to find a way to make those vessels and, and to interact with the network that has been created with the cells. So I think, I think we will get there. This is probably the final solution, right? You, I yeah. get or cell, and I, made an or I make an organ that is customized to you. You don't have to take medication because that's yours. I do believe that xenotransplantation will come before that. And then the final piece, and I, I hope to see this, that to be alive when this happens, it's probably going to be a few decades down the road, that this will be the final solution. There will be no parts in the human body that would not be replaced. Wow. I mean, let me, let me just summarize for that for you or, and people who may not have caught that. But basically getting organs from animals hopefully in the next five or 10 years, you know, become the first to do that. That'll reduce the kind of um, demand and the supply issue that we have. But in a couple of decades, hopefully in our lifetime, 3D printing where you can get human stem cells. If someone has a failing kidney, failing liver, you get their stem cells and you 3D print a brand new organ that is genetically just like the one they have, 
no need for any, you know, like immunosuppression, no risk of organ rejection, and you just make it within a couple of weeks, basically. Correct. So that's that's the final. I think that's going to be, you know, organs are going to be basically on shelf, right? You're going to give your your DNA, your cells, and they're going to make one for you, and then it's going to be replaced. And I think the biggest advantage for that, as you said is that you will don't have to take all these immunosuppression medications because that belongs to you. It's made from your body. So I think that's the final resolution, not only for what we do, uh, transplantation, but so many things in medicine, you know, that we're dealing with, fixing parts and doing this, I think we'll be able to 3D print basically everything. I mean, it's just, it's like out of a sci-fi movie. Um, you know, uh, Ben here is just commenting. I mean, so what's to stop people from living forever. <laughs> I mean, you, you can just transplant your organs with brand new organs as they start to fail. Right, so, so you go to a different part of it, right? Which is our, whole, our entire body, including our brain, our memory, everything. Aging is almost like a disease that starts happening when we are born, right? It's a disease. Why we don't call it a disease? Because in medicine, if something happens to more than 50% of the people, you don't call it a disease, right? You call it a natural event. But if you look at what's been happening, there's a guy who, a Japanese guy who won a Nobel Prize, Yamanaka, who found some of the factors that make us get old. And, you know, they fail in a way, they keep leaving their positions to repair your DNA. And he was able to get a cell that was about to die, it was very old, and he made that a baby cell again. And one of the things that he noticed, and other scientists are crazy working on this, is that our DNA seems to hold very well. What happens is that there's a lot of things that happen around the cell, the mitochondria, all those things, the factory around gets very old. Uh, so I think there's a lot of research now about you know, the sirtuins, a lot of proteins in the DNA that can potentially in the next decade or more arrest age. You know, you will remain your age. You know, that process stops. So I think when you combine that, the DNA with the fact that you can replace some of those organs that have been damaged through the time, then perhaps the child that is going to live a thousand years is born already. So, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of scary. I mean, I got to be honest, it's, it's pretty scary. I, it's great to see science advance, but yeah. that in particular is a little, is a little freakish. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, um, kind, of, kind of along those lines, as a neurosurgeon, I have to ask you, is there ever going to be brain and spinal cord transplants? I believe so. Uh, and if you go into the line, uh, again, going back to those factors that can regenerate, uh, they're doing some great work now in the optical nerve, which is not really a nerve, it's, it's neurocells. Uh, so they have been able in animals now to cause some regeneration of the optical nerve. And I think that's the first window for, for, for the cord, for the brain. Uh, I do believe that those factors will be able to regenerate the, the neural uh, tissues, which, you know, have been, as you know, extremely challenging. Uh, but I think this is all connected. I think our technology is progressing in such a fast pace that all these dreams that we had, you know, as kids watching those movies, I think, uh, you know, we might be able to see some of those things happen. And, and I, I really believe the neural tissue is going to be uh, able to regenerate. Wow. Well, listen, um, Dr. Uh, Biana, thank you for your time. What you've said today is truly mind blowing. Um, kind of gives you a window into the future of what's possible. Thanks again for everything you do, leading the largest transplant program in the country uh, with all of your leading work in terms of the Xeno transplantation. I mean, as we said, that's definitely Nobel Prize worthy. So, you know, good luck in all your research and your team is amazing. Uh, and again, thanks for taking out, you know, 30 minutes of your day to talk to us, very impressive. No problem. Listen, it's a my pleasure. And I think I hope we can inspire the next generation of doctors, you know, to come into those areas, whether it's neuro regenerating nerves or replacing organs. I think, you know, I would love to, to be a medical student again uh, to see all this happen. So it's my pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, it's very exciting. I'm thinking about changing fields. You have any uh, fellowship spots open? <laughs> <laughs> it always <is> that. <laughs> All right, buddy. Take care, okay? Have a great afternoon. It was a pleasure.